Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brett Rock, and I'm a product specialist and business development manager here with SBS. I want to thank you for taking some time today to join us for a, another edition of our Cyber Showcase today, focusing on the FTC safeguards rule. Um, just so you know, uh, the goal of, for today is to really just help you all understand what the safeguard rule is, who it covers, what compliance means, how we can help you with it, all those sorts of things. So we're going to get into a lot of good information about what the rule looks like and that sort of thing. And um, just from a housekeeping perspective, uh, we are going to have time for questions and answers at the end, hopefully. So if you have questions as we're going through this, please feel free to use the go-to meeting box that has been provided. Um, certainly, we'd be happy to answer those there. Uh, we also will have our contact information up here at multiple points throughout today's demo uh, and would certainly, or webinar rather, and would certainly encourage you to reach out to us that way. Um, a couple of ho other housekeeping things though, quickly, we do have a survey at the end as usual. Uh, if you take that for us, it'd be really helpful to improve this going forward. Um, and then finally, uh, I always forget to put the slide deck up on these things. So if you want a copy of the slides or the recording after the session is completed, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be happy to do that as well. Um, I do keep saying we, uh, which is a little bit unique for these. Normally it's just me doing uh, this on my own. Today I've got the uh, the pleasure of having Rick Olivier with us. He's our Director of Strategic Growth and Innovation. Uh, so Rick, I'll give you a second to make a quick introduction here. Yeah, thanks, Brett. Thanks for having me today. And, and thanks for all the attendees who chose to uh, tune in today to see what uh, the FTC Safeguards Rule is all about. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Rick Olivier. I currently work in Strategic Growth and Innovation. I may have met some of you along the way as I've been with the company for 17 years since our, our very early years uh, in the mid 2000s. It's been, uh, it's been fun working for SBS. It's been fun seeing the changes in cybersecurity and the regulation that accompanies those and look forward to sharing a little bit more about specifically the FTC piece of that today. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. So just an idea of what the agenda looks today. today we are going to do introductions, which were uh, mercifully a little bit way through already. Uh, we will talk about who we are as a company. For those of you who are not familiar with SBS, we'll just give you an idea of kind of who we are and what we're trying to accomplish. We're going to go through a top nine FTC safeguard rule questions and answers. Uh, now you're sitting there thinking, who does a top nine of anything? Uh, it was a top 10 list as of yesterday afternoon when Rick asked me to merge two questions together and refused to give me one to fill in the space. So uh, we are going to do a top nine question set. That's, that's his fault. Uh, we will also talk about a new offering we're rolling out, the FTC safeguard rule consulting package. Rick's going to dig into what that looks like and and uh, how we think that will be able to help you going forward. Uh, we will have some audience Q&A at the end and then potentially time permitting, uh, we may dig into the track tool a little bit, which is a part of the consulting package as well. So a lot to get through, but we're very confident we'll be able to do that. And we're excited to share this information with you. So first of all, just quickly, a little bit about who we are as a company. Again, a lot of you I'm sure are familiar with us, but we are uh, SBS Cybersecurity. We've been in the industry for 19 years. Looking forward to celebrating the big 2-0 next year. Uh, what I think is important about that, though, is we are not an accounting firm that decided to do IT audits or a you know, managed service provider that said, hey, let us handle your network security work. Uh, we have truly been in the information and cybersecurity business uh, for the last 19 years. It's what we eat, breathe, sleep, drink. It's all we do. Uh, so that's that's who we are and, and that's a big part of things um, we do have more than 1400 companies using our track tool uh, which again we may get to talk about a little bit today in over 40 states in fact we do have customers in 49 states currently so if you know anybody in idaho that needs work let us know uh, we're endorsed across the country by a variety of different associations for everything we offer we do a ton of educational stuff. Uh, many of you on the call today are probably familiar with our monthly Hacker Hour webinar series. We get about 500 plus people on that every month. Uh, we do certification program, um, all kinds of great things. And then in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, we do have what we believe to be the absolute most highly qualified people uh, in the business. So uh, lots of great reasons why our customers trust us. And, and for those of you who are current customers of ours, we really appreciate that partnership. For those of you who have not worked with us previously, uh, we look forward to potentially earning your business going forward. Really what we're trying to do as a company is two different things. The biggest thing is we do want to help make compliance easy for you. And I think that's obviously going to come into play today when we talk about the FTC safeguard rule. Many of those, many of you who are kind of being thrust into compliance with the rule um, you know, for the first time in a lot of cases, 
are going to probably find that compliance is not something that's typically easy to do. And it's not something that's fun or really sometimes gets a ton of return on investment for you. Um, our goal as a company through really everything we offer is to make that process as simple and easy as possible. And we do that through consulting and auditing and education uh, and then the tools that we've got as well. So lots of different ways that we try to make compliance as easy as we can. At the same time, we do want to help drive better decision making as well. Pretty much everything we do is in service of the idea that if we give you the information that you need, when you do have to make a decision about something, whether it's budgeting or you know you, you have something that you have to do that you're not sure you need to get on board with or whatever the case may be, but when you have to make a decision, we want to give you the information you need to make the right one. So everything we do is in service is making your life easier, making compliance easier, but also really helping drive better decision making as well. So just kind of keep both of those in mind as we're moving through this. The last thing I want to mention before we get into kind of the question and answer session here is our focus as a company is really about being more proactive when it comes to information and cybersecurity. Now, again, for those of you who are getting into being, you know, kind of being forced to be compliant for the first time, um, you know, with, with regulations and things like that, that we're going to get into, um, you probably are just focused on, I just want to do what I have to do. And that's perfectly fine, you know, as kind of a starting point. But the idea behind what we're trying to do for you is move you from kind of a reactive posture, a passive or reactive posture when it comes to information cyber and cybersecurity into being more proactive. So I think when talk, Rick talks about the, the consulting package that we're going to put together and offer here, our goal is certainly to make you compliant and get you to that point. But how do we take it a step further? and really give you a program that you actually can take advantage of and get a return on investment from. Because again, it's, it's one thing to just throw resources at a problem and hope it goes away. It's another thing to actually get value and return on investment from that. So really as a company, we're all about how do we get people from that, that reactive posture, the kind of the, the check the box mentality and move more to a proactive approach where we recognize that there's a lot of danger out there. We're talking about every 39 seconds right now, there's a cyber attack that's occurring. So by the end of this, there's going to be an awful lot of them that's happened, that, that have happened. And how do we put you in a better position to, to handle that? That's really what we're trying to do here. So uh, again, when you're first getting into this, being compliant, that's a big thing. We, want, we don't want to minimize that. That's certainly something we want to make easier for you. But we do want to get you to another step and really make you be or help you be more proactive going forward as well. So that's just kind of a, a quick idea of who SBS is and some of the philosophy that we've got um, when it comes to this stuff. All right, so uh, I'm not going to do a drum roll or anything, but we'll get into the, the top, to uh, top nine questions. I almost said top 10 again, but the top nine questions here. Um, so Rick, I'm going to ask you to answer them. I may jump in with some, uh, some additional questions, but let's start kind of with the easiest one. What is the FTC? Thanks, Brett. So first of all, before I get into what what is the FTC, I want to I want to answer uh, just a quick question that some of you may be asking as well. Um, many of you on this call, looking at the registration list, are are new to SBS webinars, and we we're looking forward to meeting you virtually today. And many of you attend a lot of our education. We thank you for that. And a lot of our customers, as you may know, are banks. So some of you may wonder, why the heck are we talking about the FTC safeguards rule anyway? Because you guys are all about banks, right? Well, that in part is true. We were formed to help banks and credit unions with their information security needs. But the needs, the, the regulation that has uh, surrounded uh, banks and credit unions specifically has really grown to a lot of other organizations. And as a company, we no longer serve just banks and credit unions. While banks and credit unions are the majority of our customers, we serve uh, a number of different industries because information security and protecting sensitive information is not specific to any one industry. Everybody needs to be looking at doing that and regulations are, are kind of coming along that way as well. So that's, I just want to answer that question um, before we jumped into the FTC uh, and, and the safeguards rule. So, the question of what is the FTC, many of you may be well aware and, and uh, they do pop up from time to time in, um, in the news, but it's the Federal Trade Commission, which is an independent organization of the, the government. I had to do a little bit of research into what their specific mission was actually for this webinar. While I know them to be more of a, 
um, antitrust, anti-monopoly uh, sort of a, an organization, which is what they do. Their stated mission is protecting the public from deceptive or unfair business practices and from unfair methods of competition through law enforcement, advocacy, research, and education. And their vision is a vibrant economy fueled by fair competition and an empowered, informed uh, public. So they are both looking at consumer protection and competition jurisdiction. We generally hear about them when there's two large companies looking to merge and looking at the competition aspect of that. But a big part of their organization is also that consumer advocacy, consumer uh, protection. And so just a little bit of history as well as they've been around since 1914. President Woodrow Wilson uh, incorporated them and they're a nonpartisan organization. There's five commissioners of the FTC and there is a, a, a rule in their bylaws that no more than three can be from any one political party. So just as a, a side note, they are a nonpartisan organization as well. And their investigations are non-public, which will come, come into play later in our conversation today. Right. But you all thought we would hear about Woodrow Wilson today, so we're off to a good start. Also, Rick came dangerously close to answering another one of our questions, which would have brought it down to a top eight, but I'm going I'm to keep it in there anyway. All right. Question number two, what is the FTC safeguard rule then? So the safeguards rule was created to ensure that entities that are covered by it are adequately protecting and safeguarding sensitive customer information. So when it says safeguards rule, it's not talking about specific information, but that is what it's about. It's about cybersecurity and protecting uh, consumer information. The rule requires that cover entities implement a number of information security best practices some of them are a little bit more high level and planning oriented and some of them are much more of a technical nature and we'll talk about the specifics of it a little bit later. The safeguards rule itself is not new though. It's been around since 2003. Uh, for, for those of you who are familiar with the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act, which is uh, the, essentially the, the act that um, required organizations, specifically financial institutions, to start protecting uh, customer information that was created in 1999 the safeguards rule came out in 2003 however it was updated which we'll talk about again a little bit uh, it updated in 2021 to be essentially be modernized uh, to expand what the rule requires and to expand which organizations are required to to comply with it for those of you who are familiar with the term information security program which is what we're what many of you have built already the safeguard rule uh, per the FTC requires that you to implement a, a, an information security program that uh, develops, maintains, and implements a, a, a comprehensive program or a kind of an all-inclusive program about, and it's written, and it contains administrative, physical, and technical safeguards. I repeat that or say that because that's the essentially the same rule that many of you are abiding by today. This is, this is telling you to do the same thing. And the way it's in which it's gonna tell you to do that is slightly different but it's essentially the same rule and just changing who it applies to and, and how we, we implement it. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. All right, so kind of based off of that, and I think you'll talk about kind of the update here and what that entailed, but who does the rule cover? We know that the financial institutions that are on the call that have worked with us in the past or have been through education with us, um, they're already being regulated in, in other ways, but so who does this rule cover? So, the, the rule covers, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna use air quotations a lot, and that's not because that's me, that's because actually how the rule is written, there's a lot of air quotations, but it covers financial institutions. So by financial institutions though, it says institutions that are subject to FTC jurisdiction that are not subject to the enforcement of another regula uh, regulatory authority under GLBA. So if you're a bank or a credit union that's being regulated, by the FDIC, OCC, Federal Reserve, NCUA, this does not cover you. You are already regulated, so this is not something you're gonna need to specifically worry about. However, if you're engaged in what's again quoted as financial activities, you're considered a financial institution under the FTC safeguards rule. So it's not really about how you classify yourself as a business, it's about the, the activities that you're uh, engaged in. So, it specifically lists out, to give you an idea, it lists out about 13 or 14 different types of organizations that would be considered financial institutions under the rule. And those, those uh, businesses are listed out as mortgage lenders, payday lenders, finance companies, mortgage brokers, account servicers, check cashers, 
wire transfers, a collection agency, credit counselors, financial advisors, tax preparation firms, investment advisors, and the new one that's been uh, added in 2021 is finders. So finders are anybody that kind of facilitates a transaction between a buyer or seller. A finder would be like an automotive dealership or a boat dealership, RV dealership, agriculture equipment. Essentially, if they're if they have something to sell and they're looking for somebody to finance that purchase, and so they they're taking kind of that credit information or they're finding that buyer, they're finding the seller to match up with it. They are now considered. Um, under or covered by the FTC safeguards rule as well. Now there is exceptions if if the organization or the entity is under 5000 has under 5000 customer records there is some ex, uh, exemptions. However, that doesn't exempt them uh, you from the rule, it just exempts you from specific pieces of the rule. You still have about I'd say half of the rule applies to you, half of the rule doesn't, but uh, you, there are some exemptions uh, built out for you. It also in the rule specifically covers who is not covered under the, the uh, rule. I think that's important to know as well because who's not covered are mostly retailers, but they, they talk about retailers that offer layaways, uh, not covered by the FTC safeguards. Retailers who uh, merely accept uh, check, cash, credit cards, they are not covered by the rule. Uh, if you can run a tab at the organization or you can cash a check, for example, you go to the grocery store, write a check for $20 over the amount and get cash back. That is not, that does not qualify you under the FTC safeguards rule. So essentially retailers for the most part, even if they're doing some specific activities are exempted. But if you're engaged in any other type of financial activity, uh, you're probably considered a financial institution for, for purposes of this rule. Mm -hmm. So is there any easy way to find out, like if somebody's sitting on the call today saying, I think I might fit in one of those categories, but I'm not positive. Is there any easy way to find out if I am covered? That's a, that's a great question. I'm not aware of a specific where you can just kind of type it in and, and go. Um, and I've never personally called the FTC, so I'm sure there's some sort of a hotline or available, uh, a way to do that. But I'm going to guess the, the line, as any government entity generally has, the, the line to get through is probably a bit long. Um, I would recommend that you kind of look at specifically the activities you're doing and and kind of evaluate honestly if they would be considered financial activity uh, excuse me financial yeah, activities and if they kind of fall in line with one of those 13 industries that they specifically call out if you're really not sure also feel free to reach out to myself uh, i'd be happy to, to take a look at it but i'm not aware of anywhere you can just kind of punch in and and it can kind of give you a yes or no answer gotcha right. so first question first question follow-up question you have and you stump me i, I don't know yeah, if wow. it's a way to find out that's what you get from messing with my my question set. <laughs> question number four, and you kind of again, you kind of walked the the tightrope on almost answering this earlier. But if I am a bank, a bank or a credit union listening today, or I'm already in a, a regulated industry, why does any of this matter to me? If I'm on the call, what am I going to take away from this today? Yeah, for for those of you who are on the call who are a, a bank or credit union uh, subject to another entity, this rule doesn't specifically apply to you. you. The rules that you have are actually a little bit more stringent than what the FTC has. There's additional requirements, but I would say that it definitely affects your organization because you're make, most likely making loans or your customers that you're uh, in business with probably you probably have customers that are affected by this. If you have a customer that's affected that would fall under an FTC organization and they are not compliant or not doing activities to be compliant, they're at significant risk, not just for, for the, the cyber bad things that can happen, not just for the, the, uh, the risk it puts them at them um, from a cyber perspective, but if they're found in trouble, there's, there's a number of civil uh, penalties and, and issues that they could have that could put your customer's business at risk by not complying uh, with this. Additionally, while I haven't seen any specific uh, banking regulation on this, if you are getting, if you're the, in the instance of a finder where that automobile or RV dealer or whoever it is, is putting that buyer and seller together, they have the buyer. And if you're the seller in that relationship, they're transacting confidential information with you to facilitate that transaction. Um, you might want to look at adding that to your vendor due diligence. Uh, is is the, the finders that you're working with, are they complying with the FTC safeguards? Because I think there's potentially a reputational risk. If that finder has issues um, and is, is fined by the FTC or has an issue, how is that going to affect 
the kind of public perception when you're working with them? I don't know the answer to that, but just something you might want to consider that it could affect um, your organization in that way. Yeah, and I'd also think, you know, financial institution, board members, things like that. I mean, there, there are probably people that, you know, transact with, with these institutions on a regular basis that probably are going to fall under this. And, you know, I, I always kind of think about it with the eye toward the future here. We've got uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month coming up in, in any day now, it feels like, but in October, uh, this might be a good topic to, to maybe start informing some of your customers about. Does that seem right, Rick? Absolutely. If if you have customers that are covered by this, um, it's it. I don't believe they're getting any specific direct information from the FTC on this. So mostly it's from trade associations, from um, uh, other people in their industry as well that they're learning about this from. So anything that you can provide to them would be helpful. So if you're a bank or credit union, you're probably already doing this stuff, and and uh, they may they may be looking for somebody for a resource to just ask questions to, and you might be able to. Uh, I continue to build that relationship with that customer by promoting that information and, and sharing some yourself. Absolutely. And to that point, we will have, as usual, a lot of different um, offerings from blog posts and white papers and uh, you know this webinar and some other things that we're doing in the near future that uh, if, if you if anybody wants to get copies of to share information with your customers, uh, you know please feel free to let us know. All right, so question number five. We're more than halfway there now. Um, let's say I am covered. What does that actually mean? And and I will preface this with we do have a slide here coming up that's going to list everything Rick is about to say in detail on the slide. Uh, so you know don't don't worry about jotting stuff down if, if you want. We can get that to you. But Rick, let's kind of just go through step by step and talk a little bit about what compliance actually means for this. Absolutely. So kind of down to the meat of what the safeguards rule is is requiring. There's essentially nine categories that it lists, and we'll go through each of them individually. But just to kind of just to hit the high points to start, the first thing is we need to designate a. You're going to see me use air quotes. Qualified individual. You need to designate a qualified individual. Conduct a risk assessment. Design and implement safeguards to control risk identified through risk assessment. So how do you once you do that risk assessment? What are the controls you need to implement? Uh, monitor and, a, and testing the effectiveness of those controls you've implemented. Training your staff. Monitoring your service providers or third parties. Keeping your information security program current. An incident response program. And then lastly, making sure that you're annually reporting to the board. So going back through those nine, the first one is designate that qualified individual. So you need to essentially have somebody that's that knows what they're doing with information security. So if you're an FTC safeguard uh, uh, covered entity and you don't have anybody in your organization who is qualified, that's the first thing you're going to need to figure out. The first question that you're going to need to answer is who's our qualified individual. So you can have that individual be somebody in the organization, but again, they need to be qualified. Now. The safeguards rule says that what you would be expecting from a, say, a, a small organization to a very large organization, the expectations differ and that the, the qualified individual's experience and knowledge could differ along with that. But they need to have an understanding of cybersecurity that's appropriate for your organization. They don't need to have a specific degree or background, but they need to have that, that basic level of understanding of cybersecurity. It also doesn't necessarily need to be somebody internally. So while you can designate somebody internally, if you have somebody qualified, you can also assign a, a third party as the qualified individual. Um, so if if you have, say, an MSP that has somebody that's that's really good at, at cybersecurity, they can be your qualified individual. You can talk to SBS. We can be your qualified individual. There's other companies out there that can be your qualified uh, individual. But uh, you can't, as an organization, just assign that risk out to the third party. While you can assign that qualified individual to a third party, you, the rule specifically states you can't essentially outsource that risk. That responsibility may, remains with your organization. You have to assign a senior employee to work with a qualified individual if it's an, an outsourced uh, person. So you can't just say, hey, this uh, um, Rick is our qualified individual and we'll call him if needed. No, you need to have a senior employee of your organization that's working with that qualified individual uh, as a requirement. So you have that senior level access. 
And also, if you have an affiliate that's doing this for you, that affiliate must maintain an information security program, program that conduct, uh, protects your, their business, your business as well. So you can't, you can't be expected to have a security program, assign a qualified individual, and that organization doesn't have security protecting your information as well. They, they have to have that security, and, and that will kind of be part of the third-party pro, third risk program as well. So qualified individual. So, Rick, let me stop you there. I know that for in the financial services industry, which a, a lot of our customers are in, there does have to be separation between kind of the IT side of the house and the information security side of the house. And those lines get blurred sometimes, but is there anything in the uh, in the rule that kind of specifies any of that? No, there, there isn't. There's no, it there doesn't talk about separation of duties. Now that is an industry best practice. And that is just a good practice to have as a separation of duties because your IT team and an information security provider generally have related but different goals. Um, the, the, the IT team's focus is generally making sure that all the, the systems are open and working and running and, and available, where a security person is making sure that it, they're secure. And sometimes those things go in contrast, and so you have to have a kind of a decision process of what if something, we need it available, but it's completely unsecure. How do we, how do we kind of balance that decision? So it's a good industry best practice to have separation there. However, uh, the rule doesn't have anything specifically precluding that. It just says your qualified individual has to have security now, cybersecurity and knowledge appropriate for your organization. And just by being technical in nature doesn't necessarily mean you have cybersecurity knowledge because cybersecurity knowledge also we're talking about, uh, which we'll talk about in a second, risk assessments, vendor management programs, all those things are, are, um, are, are familiar, but also a bit of a, a specialty role. It's not just Fred knows how to use a computer. Let's have him do it, right? It's, it's, right. it's a little bit more than that. So right. okay. what was, what's the next piece after qualified individual then? So uh, uh, the second piece is conducting a risk assessment and needs to be an asset-based risk assessment. And so that's, that's uh, the type of risk assessment that SBS has traditionally performed. An asset-based risk assessment means understanding where your information is. So if we understand where information is and what technology assets hold that information, then we need to look at the, the risks uh, of, that, of, um, of a breach to that asset. We need to look at the controls in place to prevent those threats from happening and, and understand, again, as an organization, which assets do we have and which, which threats pose the greatest risk to those assets in our organization. So they're talking about specifically an asset-based risk assessment and also periodic reassessments. You can't just do it do that risk assessment and say, I'm forever done. As things change, as risks change, as new threats emerge, as new technologies are implemented at your organization, you need to reevaluate and update that, that risk assessment. Mm -hmm. um, step three, design and not, I shouldn't say step three, it's just item three. They don't have to be in succession. Design and implement safeguards to control risks identified through the risk assessment. So the risk assessment talks about the risks and the controls that we may want to uh, institute to help uh, mitigate that risk. So then the third one is how do we actually put those in place? And it gets pretty prescriptive in, in this area where your risk assessment could, could give you a number of uh, th uh, recommendations and controls to implement. This talks about specifically access controls, having an asset inventory. So backing up again a little bit, access controls are understanding what your users have access to. So not every user in your organization needs to have access to every system, but you need to have a way in which to kind of um, to monitor and, and process that. An asset inventory, making sure you understand what technology and where your information resides. That's the start of a risk assessment, but keeping that asset inventory up is also a part of a good security practice. Encrypting your data, not only in REST while it's stored at your organization, but if you're sending it out, how is it encrypted in transit? Uh, assess your app. So if you're using apps or applications, both internal and third parties, those need to be thought through, make sure that they're secure. Multi-factor authentication for anyone that accesses customer information. So whatever employees that you have that access to customer information need to have multi-factor authentication turned on uh, for them. Information disposal. Go Rick, ahead, Brett. Uh, just for those of people that might not be as familiar, what does is, what is multi-factor authentication do? Yeah, so essentially multi-factor authentication 
uh, it provides two different ways in which you need to verify something. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with MFA, whether you know it as MFA or not. When you enter, let's say, into um, an email system, you have to enter a password. So that's something that you know, something that, that you know, this password to your email system. But then before you can get into that email or whatever system it is, it sends you a, a code on your phone. So that phone then, or if that's how your multi-factor is working, is something you have. So now you know something and you have something that can kind of confirm that identity through two different ways. Uh, you can also use multi-factor through, through biometrics, through a fingerprint, through facial reading, but it's through two different mechanisms, multi, two, that's what multi-factor is, and it's a, an extremely effective control. Um, kind of the statistics I've read on that is multi-factor, if you have that enabled, prevents about 99% of breaches for, breaches for consumers, so it's a very effective uh, control. Excellent. Thank you. Question. Yep. Uh, information disposal. So when you're ready to get rid of a piece of technology that has information on it, whether that's a hard drive or, or whatever it is, you have to have a policy in a way that you're disposing of that information, uh, anticipating and evaluating changes to information security and your network. If you're making changes as far as how your network is set up, what's that going to add for risk? You need to make, make sure that you're evaluating those sorts of things uh, specifically. And lastly, in the control section, it talks about logging uh, of the activity of your authorized users and watching for unauthorized access. So if you have authorized users that are accessing information, make sure you have a log to that, that you can go back and trace to that, and then also a way that you can monitor for unauthorized access. So some of the other items in there, so we've talked about qualified individual risk assessment, implementing controls based on the risk assessment, then monitoring and testing those controls. So making sure that they're in place and working. You can either have one of two things. One, you can have some sort of a continuous monitoring uh, of, of your network and of your, your systems, or if you don't have continuous monitoring, the rule requires that you do an annual penetration test and a vulnerability assessment, which looks for missing patches, things like that, at least every six months. So either continuous monitoring, which you may be getting through an MSP or it may have internally if you have a large enough IT team. Otherwise, you have to do at least an annual pen test and a vulnerability assessment every six months and also do those tests whenever there's a major change to your information or network. You need to train your staff. Uh, make sure that they know what to look for. We know that in security, people are often one of our weakest links, unfortunately. Make sure that they actually know what they're looking for. How can they spot a, a a suspicious email or suspicious activity, and what would they do with it if they did spot it? So make sure to train those employees. Monitor your service providers. This really gets back to vendor management. If you have a service provider that has information, or, or it's your, your MSP, whoever you have, you need to make sure that anybody that has access to your information is securing that information in a secure manner, or at least in the same way that you would, making sure that you're not just handing that information off and crossing your fingers that they probably have good controls because you know they have a, they have a good name. Well, just because they have a, a good name um, doesn't necessarily mean they have good controls. So just do a, a way to, to kind of trust but verify. We assume they do, but now let's verify that they actually have those those good controls. Uh, we you need to keep your information security program current. So I mentioned a couple times already. As things change, you need to make sure that you're updating your your policies, your risk assessment, the, that vendor management program. Your in, you have to have an incident response program. For those of you unfamiliar with an incident response program, we call it how to fail well. So in the event that, that you have some sort of a, uh, not even a breach, but some sort of a security, cybersecurity incident that you suspect something happened that shouldn't happen or is out of the ordinary, what is the plan and what is the process for how we deal with that? Trying to figure out who you're going to call and what you're going to do when that happens in the moment that it happens is, is not a, and that's a plan to fail badly because you're trying to guess at what you should be doing. If you have a plan that says, here's who needs to be contacted, here's who needs to, to be notified, uh, here's who, what we need to do specifically, that will help in the instance that you're the victim of a, a cyber attack, it will help you uh, kind of fail well or, or make things uh, be a little smoother, a little less damage in the event that one of those things things happen. 
And then lastly, the qualified individual needs to report to the board at least annually on, on um, the kind of the GLBA report is what we call it in the, the financial sector, but essentially an update on what things have been happening in, the inf in your information security program, what tests have been happening, and just make sure the board, or if you don't have a board, um, senior management needs to be notified at least annually in a report of what's happening in your information security program. That's a wow. lot of information, which we'll talk about, but uh, that, that is what the safeguard jewel is. So know? the financial institutions on the call that are, are laughing right now and saying, finally, somebody else has to do this stuff. It's, uh, I'm sure they're there, but uh, it does feel a lot like drinking out of a fire hose, I imagine, for anybody who's, who's rel relatively new to, to this world of compliance. So, all right. I think we do have some offerings to help with that. So we'll, we'll kind of keep that in mind as well. Question number six. How long do I have? <laughs> you so, know, we talked about the rule got updated in, in 2021. Uh, how long do I have to become compliant? So that's a that's a great question. As I'm, as Brett already mentioned too, that the rule changed in 2021 to expand the rule itself and also expanding who it's covered. So so massive expansion of the rule. And the original implementation date, uh, I, I I may I may correct myself here. I, I, it's either the original or the second implementation date because they've moved it twice was December of 2022. So last December was when it was supposed to go into effect. Shortly before that, they moved it to June of 2023, which was uh, a, a two months ago. So that's a long way of saying it's in effect now uh, and it needs to be implemented now. So how long do you have to become compliant? Uh, it needs to be, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's in, in place now. I know there's a lot of organizations that are still just getting their arms around it and are starting to implement it, but by rule, it's um, it's implemented. So you mentioned some, uh, and I probably could ask this on the last slide. I apologize, but you mentioned some exceptions to the rule uh, in terms of, you know, not necessarily we don't have to do any of this stuff, but there is kind of a scaled back version. What what does that look like for anybody? I think it's under five thousand customers. Is that correct? Yeah, five thousand customer records essentially, and so. If even as a small business over the course of time, you're going to accumulate records. So it is a pretty small exception. But if you do have less than 5,000 customer records, the rule still applies. There are specific pieces that don't. Some of the specific pieces that don't are you don't need to have a risk assessment. You don't need to have an incident response program. And you don't need to uh, report to the board annually. Um, those are kind of three of the biggest pieces. Still having a qualified individual, having the, the appropriate safeguards and controls in place and testing those safeguards, those, those things still do apply. Okay, excellent. So rules in effect, um, we probably need to be working on this in, in, the, in the very short term at this point. Um, question number seven, what are the penalties for not being compliant? So if I'm not doing this right now and somebody finds out tomorrow, what, what am I looking at? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So um, I have I've read, listened to, talked to a number of organizations who are are looking at this, and generally the answer that I've heard over and over again is it's civil penalties, and that, that is I, I can find verification that civil penalties are what would happen if uh, if you're found for not being compliant, and the numbers I've heard are $11,000 per day per instance. So if you have multiple violations, it can be uh, more than one violation today, but $11,000 per day per instance is up is the maximum civil penalty. Now in doing research for this webinar, I was unable to verify that number uh, anywhere on the from the FTC. So uh, I'm not gonna put that as th this is the word, this is what it is, but that's the word that's kind of been circulating um, as, as the number, but either way, the, the penalties for non-compliance are civil money, money uh, penalties. Mm -hmm. So I guess kind of another question, piggybacking off of that, how would anybody know? How would anybody know that I'm not compliant right now or yeah. not compliant six months from now? Good question. So essentially there's gonna be three ways in which, in which that could happen. One is the FTC does do some, some investigation. So if they're investigating uh, your organization for something else and they find non-compliance with the FTC safeguard rule, that could be one way. Now, the FTC, uh, from my understanding, doesn't have a specific auditing plan where they're just going out and randomly auditing organizations for compliance. 
so you could but you could be found in an investigation but the other two probably most likely scenarios is one if somebody reports you to the FTC let's say a, a, um, a, a disgruntled employee or partner or or some a customer who's upset about something and is aware of these sorts of rules if they report you to the FTC that would put you on the radar and then they may come in and and um, that would be how you could be kind of found out for non-compliance or number two is kind of a worse situation i would say if you have a security breach so you have a breach of customer information all 50 states now have data breach notification laws and you're required to report if you have a data breach so if you have a data breach uh, now the FTC is going to be notified of that too, and they're going to look for non-compliance of that rule. So if you have a breach, it, it's going to kind of pile up because you're not only going to have the issues, the breach, you could potentially have some issues with the safeguards rule. If, a, if um, somebody reports you or if they find it in a routine investigation, that would be the three main ways in which you could be found. So putting aside the potentially pretty stiff penalties, it sounds like, what are the other benefits of being compliant? I mean, I talked a little bit about our company. We focus on being proactive. We focus on doing this stuff, not just for the sake of doing it, but because it's good practice and we can protect ourselves and our customers and things like that. Kind of, you know, I, I, you know the stats are pretty overwhelming, right? 43% of cyber attacks right now are against small businesses. So I imagine a lot of those are encompassed here. And then 60% of those small businesses that suffer a cyber attack are usually out of business within six months. So you want to talk a little bit about kind of the benefits of, you know, we want to be compliant. We certainly don't want to get a $11,000 a day fine, but you know, what are the other benefits we can see from being compliant? So having a good information security program is, is while, while regulation may be the driver, that's not the best reason to do it because we know that cybersecurity is a big risk. As you just pointed out with some stats, it's a big risk for your organization. As, as technology and time continues to move forward, I think we all agree that our reliance in any in industry on technology is continuing to grow and it's becoming, we're, we're incredibly reliant on technology. As artificial intelligence starts to enter the market and your business will probably start to evaluate that in some way or shape or in the future, that's going to accelerate it even faster. As we look at more cloud computing sorts of options, so we have data that's used to all be stored in our, our network and now, over half of that data is stored somewhere else already, and that's continuing to grow, grow rapidly. We're sending our data to a lot of different places. Also, we're using a lot of different types of technology. So we used to have, say, maybe 10, 15 different pieces of technology we're using. Now we're using 30, 40, 50, and that's going to continue to evolve because that's how we need what we need to serve our customers. So as all of these changes continue to happen, you can't just continue to manage your security and your cybersecurity in the same way you did before. You need an organized plan in how to do that, or you're opening yourself up for, to, to, as a more likely victim of a cyber crime. So while the guidance may be pushing you to do something, the risk of cyber, uh, cyber attacks and our increasing reliance and changing of the technology world it doesn't require, but it does, I'm going to use the air quotes, require you to have some sort of a plan with how you're going to protect yourself from, from cyber threats. If you don't have a plan, you're, uh, you're just crossing your fingers and hoping something bad doesn't happen. And I think that, you know, two things that, that I would mention in addition to that is you talk about adding technology, adding services. A lot of that does come with adding vendors, right? Vendor management's a big part of what the safeguard rule requires. But if I have a bunch of vendors that have my information and that number's getting higher every day and there's lots of great reasons to use vendors, that obviously puts me at greater risk. I'm more spread out. I have more attack surface basically because my information's just about everywhere. So uh, I think that's one big thing to think about. And then, you know, I think what we find in a lot of cases is this doesn't necessarily, being proactive doesn't necessarily mean more effort, more energy. It just means doing it the right way. And if you lack the time and the expertise that you know, that might prevent you from doing it the right way, that's why a company like SBS can be really helpful. So I, I do want to make it clear that we're not necessarily saying you have to you know, put a ton of energy and resources more than you're already doing potentially, uh, but doing it the right way and having the right mentality is, is, is a lot of the battle there. Absolutely. So, all right. 
Question number eight, you already kind of covered this a little bit, but are there any reporting requirements around this? Uh, no, there are no reporting requirements that you have to tell somebody you're compliant. However, everything you're doing in the program, make sure you document it. It talked about a written security program. When you, when you do something, make sure it's documented. Because in the event that you have one of those three ways come up that you could be the uh, part of an investigation, you need to make sure that you can prove that you're doing what you say you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And then the last one, question number nine. Um, if I do need help, and I think we're going to answer this in greater detail in just a few minutes, so we don't have to do it right now, but if I need help, if I'm covered, or you know, for those of you on the call who have finders, have partners that or customers that might need help. You know, there are a lot of outlets for that. And, and, and certainly I think Rick's gonna lay out here in just a moment what we're gonna do or what we're gonna be able to offer from uh, from a consulting perspective to, to help out further. But Rick, I don't know if you wanna add anything there before yeah. we move on a little bit. So so as Brett mentioned, we have a package and we'd love for you to call us uh, and, and let us help you. That's our, our mission is to help organizations with uh, their cybersecurity. But outside of that, we understand there are a lot of options out there. I would, uh, if you have an MSP or a managed service provider, that'd be a call that I'd make. I'd make a call to them, ask them what they know about that, that about the rule and about what they can do, because a number of the, the controls that we're gonna recommend anyway are going to be technical controls, which your MSP can provide. So I would talk to them uh, about, about that. That would be one of the first calls I make. Uh, if you have, if if you're a bank or credit union, you have customers or partners that that need help. Uh, feel free to again pass along our information, pass along the information on the safeguards rule. Just ask them what they're doing about it. Uh, SBS also we also work with partners, so we work with MSPs and other organizations to help them. So while they have they are wanting to help you as well, that helps them. We can come alongside them uh, with different services and products to kind of. Uh, complement their offerings to help you as well. But if I needed help, what can we do? Uh, learn about the regulation, get a qualified individual. If you have one on staff, great. If you don't find that qualified individual, that's gonna be priority number one. Call your MSP or a trusted security partner, somebody like SBS, that would be where I would start. Excellent. No 10th question as we've, dis we've discussed already, but I think we did pretty well there. So just quickly, what are the pains we're trying to resolve? We covered a lot of these already, but compliance is kind of the big one, right? We need, we know that as of two months ago, we need to be compliant with this rule. So that's a big thing, right? You know, there are potential penalties out there and the, the numbers may vary a little bit, but they do seem pretty significant. So we got to think about that. You know, developing an ISP, maintaining your ISP once you have it developed, we've talked about that. But really what it comes down to in a lot of cases is these two, right? You know, we have a lack of time. Everybody wears a, you know, 10 hats, you know, us included, Rick and I are both doing, getting pulled in a bunch of different directions. So I think we feel your pain, but the lack of time. And then maybe most importantly is the lack of expertise, right? We don't know what we don't know. And I think the biggest thing when it comes to information and cybersecurity is just be honest with yourself about that. There's, you know, that's, this is a big field. There's a lot of different moving pieces to it. Um, you know, I, I would show you the, the ISP blueprint that we're relatively famous for, but it might make people's heads spin a little bit. So I'm not going to go there today. Uh, but there's a lot of different moving pieces here. And, and just being able to recognize that we don't have the time to do this. We don't have the expertise to do this. We need somebody to get us started. We need somebody to help us long term. Uh, certainly, those are pains that, that we're going to try to address. And, and as Rick mentioned, there are others that, that can help with that as well. Probably should have thrown this up earlier. Well, well we're going to talk about that. Probably should have thrown this slide up earlier. This is the uh, the reminder of what compliance looks like. So everything that Rick covered on this slide, again, if you want the slides, uh, feel free to let me know. Um, I can send them to you afterward. But Rick, why don't you talk a little bit about what is included? And I put them all on the screen here so we don't have to go one at a time. But I'm going to I'm gonna let you cover what's included as part of the consulting package. Yeah, so, so SBS has created a, an FTC safeguards package. While the FTC safeguards package is is specifically new as an offering to us. Every single thing that's in it, we've been doing for for 17 years. It's just the way of of which it's uh, which it's bundled. So this is what we do. This is our bread and butter, so to speak. But to kind of walk through these items, first of all, what's included in the package? We have a track software, which many of you may be familiar with or using, uh, and that track software is an automated way, a way to build kind of um, expertise into a tool 
and it's, it has a number of modules in it. So within track, the IT risk assessment can be completed in an asset-based way, meeting the rules of the FTC safeguards rule. Vendor management or managing your, your service providers is, is how the safeguards rule has it listed. That can be done and managed and done within track. ISP, that stands for Information Security Program Documentation, that's policies, things like that. Those can be created, there's templates, they can be updated, they can be managed within track. And then there's an action tracking module as well, where you can take things you want to change and, and uh, track the changes of those. That is all within the track tool. So that track tool is part of the package. Additional, no, go ahead. Rick, let me just get in there real quick. So track is something that can be used in an ongoing capacity as well. So some of the stuff is are things we're gonna be doing up front, but track in particular is something that they can use to maintain going forward, correct? Correct. Yeah, it's a long-term solution. So while your your immediate need might be to build that, that's what this program is built for, I should say as well, is to kind of get you up and going to a place where you can manage it yourself. We have additional offerings we'll talk about that can help with other areas, but it's meant to do this long-term because these are requirements going forward, not just a one-time exercise. Absolutely. So one thing that might also be helpful for our banks and credit unions on the call is we have multiple uh, industries in our in track. Well, we have an industry for banks and credit unions, but we also have an industry for small businesses or just a business in general that, that's not specific to the banking and credit union world. We also have a healthcare version. Um, those are probably the three most popular versions. We have some different versions of track. They all process information the same way, but they have different information, different assets, threats, things like that listed. So uh, addition to the track, we also are going to provide you with a, a security consultant. Uh, a professional cybersecurity consultant that's going to help you get going with your IT risk assessment. So they're going to load uh, a, a, a bunch of your assets, depending on the size of your organization, uh, uh, quite a few assets for you into the risk assessment and get that completed with you. Uh, we're going to create an incident response plan. We're going to get your vendor management program set up. We're going to make sure that you know how to do it. We're going to make sure that, it, that you're trained in it and kind of set up to your organization specifically. We're gonna get your policies and all the documents that you need that are required in the regulation. We're gonna get those created. And we're gonna do some uh, consulting based on all those different technical controls that are required. We're gonna do some general consulting on your organization to make sure that you know specifically if you're already meeting that based on what you're doing, or if there's some new things that you need to be doing to meet that. So it's just kind of uh, us, our understanding of the rule can help you understand if in fact, maybe you're meeting all of these requirements or based on the rule, if there's additional requirements that, that you need to, to implement. Okay. Excellent. So again, this is a, a consultant that would be assigned to their account. They get access to track. We would use that yeah. as kind of the platform to start building things out. And you know, while we have some ongoing options, we'll talk about track is certainly something that they could use going forward as well. So Correct. And this is, as you mentioned, this is a one-time option. So this is an option for us to come in kind of get you get you going, get you to a point of, of compliance, or you actually know what you need to do to be compliant if you have controls yet. But it's one time we come in and then we we kind of back out. We'll leave you with track so you can continue to manage those those things going forward. But this is this specific package is not an ongoing relationship. It's a, us coming in, getting it built and leaving you with track so you can manage it yourself and the cost goes down. Um, uh, quite a bit then after a while, after a while as well, so you can just manage your, manage it yourself. So, what is expected of the client then, if we were to, to somebody sign for the consulting package tomorrow? Yeah, so so if you sign up with us for the consulting package, we can help you build that. You're going to need to designate a qualified individual. Remember, that's the number one rule. And if you're going to manage it long long term yourself, you need to designate that qualified individual. We uh, have some education that can help. If you have somebody that has some of that qualifications, we have some education that can help you um, get that individual to be more qualified. Again, it's not a specific, there's no, there's no standard of what qualified means, but you need that qualified individual and we're gonna need some of their time uh, while we're working with you on this. We're gonna need a list of all of your technology assets. So all the pieces of it, uh, technology that you have that have information in it, we're gonna need that. We're going to need a list of all the vendors that you're working with and the information that they have. Um, we're going to need somebody that can provide timely responses as we create documentations and, and policy. Uh, we, we don't want it to be a program where we're trying to figure this out and then we got to wait you know, 30 days for an answer and we want to help you get this built. So we just need timely responses 
uh, if we're going to help you build that out. And then um, ongoing with vendor management, while we're building the program out for you, you're going to have to have somebody internally, whether it's a qualified individual or somebody else that's actually completing those vendor reviews. We have a service we can do that, but as part of the package, we would just get, get it up and going, get it set up, trained in so you can do it, but you'd need to have somebody that can do that. And then we also want, um, we'd request some contacts with your MSP. So if there's technical requirements that need to be implemented, we want to make sure that we can talk to them and, and um, discuss yeah. with them what they need. And there may be some people on the call, and most of people know what an MSP is, a managed service provider, but Rick, that's the people that would generally be there to, to make sure that things are working. If you outsource the patching and the making sure your computers work and all those sorts of things, that's uh, that's what a managed service provider would be. That's your IT provider, uh, yeah. just to, uh, it's, that's kind of referred to either as an IT provider or your managed service provider, that's correct. All right. So let's talk a little bit about that. That's kind of how we would get you up and running, but what are some of the other offerings that we can provide maybe in a more long-term solution? Yeah, so while those are the core pieces of it, there are some other things that you may want to consider. One of those is a product that we resell called Know Before. It would, it would meet that training requirement as in the, that's in the, the regulation of training your employees, but it also tests your employees to make sure that not only are we training them, but is the training sticking? Are they understanding it? Uh, we mentioned that if you don't have on, uh, ongoing monitoring, you have to do annual penetration tests and biannual vulnerability assessments. We can perform them for you. Have a team that that's what they do. They 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 attempt to hack in organizations. There's also if you um, just want a, uh, a kind of an assessment. So you think maybe I'm already complying with this, but I would like somebody to kind of come in and do a review of our security to to really understand where we're at. The cybersecurity essentials assessment is going to be able to give your organization an understanding of where you're at risk and where you're you're pretty good. So it's going to be what we would call an auditor would come in and look at all your security controls, your technical, your physical, um, and your administrative controls to see where you're at as an organization. There's a if you need a qualified individual, I'm skipping a couple here, but if you need a qualified individual. We actually have services that can provide you that ongoing option as well. And they're generally part of our virtual uh, our VC, so our virtual information security officer program. That's an ongoing relationship. So rather than us just coming in and fixing it, we can provide you with an ongoing relationship where we act as an information security officer for your organization. And kind of um, while you have maybe an IT person or team, we counterbalance that with being the, the security person for the organization. Yeah, so there's all kinds of offerings. For those of you that are familiar with us, you probably are familiar with a lot of these things, but um, you know, since we're kind of coming close on time here, if, if anybody has any questions about any of these services or you know, what we can do to, to help and again, a more long-term capacity, we're happy to help uh, to provide some information about that as well. So with that said, just a couple of takeaways before we, we see if there were any questions that came in. Um, you know, I think these are things that are important to consider. The FTC safeguard rule isn't new right this is something that's been around for quite a while but the changes in recent years 2021 as rick mentioned really expanded the 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 people or the companies that fall under the rule uh, and then a lot of the specifics about the rule as well so uh, a lot of different changes recently the rule is very very detailed when it comes to being to what com being compliant means so i think that's actually a helpful thing um you know it, it, if it were nebulous, if it were something that it was you know, really difficult to figure out what they're trying to tell us to do, that'd be one thing, but they are pretty pretty specific about it. And that's you know something we can help you interpret a lot of that. Um, but again, it, it's pretty specific about what, you're, what you need to be doing. Um, avoiding penalties is not the only benefit. As Rick mentioned, and I hate giving him credit for stuff, he'd be the first to tell you that, but uh, you know, dry, the compliance should not be the driver behind why we're doing this. The benefits are really about avoiding the risk uh, and protecting ourselves and our customers and things like that. Avoiding penalties is a side effect and, and something that's obviously very important as well. Uh, even if you aren't covered by the rule, there's great potential that your clients, customers, and partners might be. Those finders, again, that was something that was added in the 2022, 2021 rather update. Uh, so something to seriously consider there. Um, the penalties can be pretty uh, significant. And then we do have a lot of different offerings, including this new safeguard rule consulting package that we're really excited about that can really help for anybody, whether you're starting from scratch 
all the way up to we think we have something in place, but we want to make sure that it's right or that it's working or we want to get help long term. So lots of different ways we're happy to help, uh, whether that's education only, whether it's providing some assistance, whatever it is, um, we're here to, to help out as, as everybody's getting used to, to what these changes look like. So with that said, I know, again, we've got about a minute left. I didn't see any questions come in, which means I, I guess Rick and I did a great job. Um, Rick, thank you so much for being on here with us today. Our contact information's on the screen there. If you want to reach out to us directly, please feel free to do so. If you want the slide deck, a copy of the recording, whatever we can do to help, um, please let Rick or I know. We're happy to do that. Um, and then if you don't mind taking the survey when you're done, we really appreciate that as well. But uh, again, thank you, Rick. Thank you everybody for joining today. Hopefully this was helpful and informative. Uh, and if there's anything we can do to help, you know, please do, do not hesitate to let us know. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone.